so I'm just going to get started. Um, our first poet is Nina Mingyo Pals, who is a writer and a zine maker from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, she lives in London. Um, I was lucky enough to meet Nina when she had just arrived in London. Um, I work at the Poetry Society and she was volunteering for us and I feel like we got her doing something very mundane like rolling poems on the underground posters which is just a mundane part of my job um, but yeah I immediately knew that she was very cool and I'm very excited to see that she has made, been making huge waves in poetry as the National Poetry Librarian, um, founder of Bitter Melon Press, um, author of a forward prize shortlist debut collection Magnolia Muklan. I've said that in Cantonese, I realise you don't, <laughs> I don't know what it is in Mandarin, <laughs> sorry. Um, she's also an acclaimed essayist, if you don't know. Um, she's published essays on nature writing, open water swimming, um, and maybe most famously food with her beautiful Emma Press collection of essays, Tiny Moons, um, which uh, got me off uh, that sofa over there last year and made me make some dumplings of my own as soon as I finished it. Um, she also makes her own clothes um, and like uh, Teresa Hatkin Cha, who she's going to be resurrecting, is very into multimedia. And when I was reading the um, Marina Svetaiva just now, I was thinking um, of the slovenly needlewoman, all our sewing came apart. Um, so yeah, I'm just really excited for this. Oh, one other thing that I should say is um, that Nina has created in response to um, Teresa Hatkin Cha, um, this beautiful zine, which you can get from our website. Um, it's amazing and just a gorgeous artifact and as you can see it like opens up so it's kind of an unusual it's like a map and I don't know how you're meant to read it but I suspect that's the point it doesn't matter which order you read it in which I love um, so you can order that on our website we'll drop links in the chat at some point um, but you anyone can read it through it after the event well it was a really long introduction there's a lot to say about Nina but um, I'm going to shut up now and Please welcome Nina Minya Pals. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, yeah, that was such a lovely introduction. And thank you, Lily and Jasmine as well, and Bridget. Um, I'll get started. I will share my screen and hope that it will work. Um, Okay, so before I get started, um, I want to just offer a brief um, content warning to let everyone who's listening know that just at the beginning of my talk, Resurrection Poems, um, I will reference rape and I will reference murder at the beginning. Um, but I'll start with Teresa Hakyong Cha's words. So this is from Dicte. You write, you write, you speak, voices hidden, masked. You plant words to the moon. You send word through the wind, through the passing of seasons. By sky and by water, the words are given birth, given discretion. From one mouth to another, from one reading to the next, the words are realized in their full meaning. The wind, the dawn or dusk, the clay earth and traveling birds, southbound birds are mouthpieces, wear the ghost veil for the seed of message, correspondence, to scatter the words. So, this image here is Teresa Hak Yong Cha. Um, and she, if you don't know already, you might know, um, she was an artist, a poet, um, most famously known, I think, as a performance artist and conceptual artist. And she was born in 1951 in Busan, South Korea. And she immigrated with her family to America when she was a child. Um, she lived and worked in New York. And at the time of her death, she was working at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the textiles department, which I'm really interested in. Um, 
1982, her book, Dicte, which I have here, um, had just been published and she was about to take part in quite a big group exhibition and her career as an artist was just taking off. Um, but on the 5th of November, she was raped and murdered by a man who worked as a security guard at the building where her husband worked in New York. And um, I recently kind of rediscovered Cha in depth in um, this book by Kathy Park Hong called Minor Feelings. There's an essay towards the end of the book about Cha called Portrait of an Artist. Um, and it's an attempt to kind of break the silence around Cha's horrendous death, uh, which is quite often regarded as too awful to speak of, and in many ways it really is. But um, yeah, I feel that same fear of dwelling on it too much, um, but it's kind of, I can't avoid it um, when speaking or writing about Teresa Hak Yong Cha. So like Hong, I don't want her story to be shrouded in silence. Um, thinking of how the deaths of Asian women, women of color are so often forgotten or uh, silenced. But I also want to look past it and read her work, not read all of her work as haunted, which I'm definitely guilty of doing. Um, but Dictate, which I just read from, is really one of the strangest things I've ever read. Um, you may, you might have picked up from my reading, but it's the syntax is so jumbled. Entering dictate is kind of almost like reading a new language or a new version of English that's a bit unfamiliar. Um, there are many passages where speech is kind of mirroring, mirroring the speech of childhood kind of collage layers of sound. And it's not a narrative. Um, it's many, a chorus of voices of women pieced together. Um, in many places, it seems to be the voice of her mother. And sometimes she's speaking through the voice of her mother. Um, sometimes it's mythological figures like Joan of Arc. And there's lots of visual parts to it. So it's, I'm very interested in how photographs and visual art can play a role in poetry and dicta is very much a multimedia text, which is kind of why I love it. Um, this sh just shows a couple of the spreads of, from dicta, which shows the visual aspect, um, the multilingualness of the book. Um, it is mostly in a kind of English, but there's also lots of untranslated passages of French and Latin, which I love. Um, these parts are in a section that, uh, where lots of memories of Char's school years kind of surface. Um, and she attended a Catholic school and I think was learning French. So I think that was not long after she immigrated to the US as well. So it's kind of memorializing that time and this is an instance where calligraphy comes into it, which had a big influence on me. Um, those characters there um, say fu mu in Chinese, um, which means parents. So there's a lot of ancestry throughout the book. Um, and I keep, when I read dictate, I keep, um, oh, did I skip one? Yeah. Um, I keep coming back to this quote from the contemporary Korean poet Kim Hai Soon, um, which is that I can't read the whole thing on my screen, but I've got it here. Um, Women's or death song is sung only in vowels without the consonants. They say the name of father, God, is made of only consonants, but the language of woman, death, is made up of sounds that come before or after language. Um, and I don't know if Kim Hai Soon was 
directly influenced by char maybe not but um i feel that this really connects to how i read dicte and the way that she's often reaching for pure sound and the sound of the body and that for me really sums up how i relate to poetry um, as something that comes from the body and um Kathy Park Hong, who I mentioned earlier, also has written about how um, reading dictate for the first time, it was reading a text where the poet is showing you that English is not their first language. Um, so English, she writes, English could never be a true reflection of her consciousness. It was as much an imposition on her consciousness as it was a form of expression. And because of that, Dicte felt true. I really love that. Um, but so, as I mentioned, Cha made a lot of video art um, and lots of performance art. There's quite a lot of images of her performing. But basically, this PowerPoint is lots of pictures of her art <laughs> um, and then later pictures of some of my poems. But so she made some really interesting textile art which interests me um, as Helen mentioned I very recently started teaching myself how to sew and it's made me think about how this can connect to my creative practice and so when I look at her textile art um, like this one is a is a big panel of cloth with uh, words sewn onto the cloth um, so I think of like the, the, rep the repetitive act of stitching, this piecing together of layers, which to me really connects to Dicte and her writing. And you can also see in this one, the influence of concrete poetry, um, visual poetry, and how much the word itself is like a form, uh, like an art form that she can manipulate and use as a kind of a block and a pattern, which is really interesting. Um, and so she made lots of little books, which is very exciting to me. Um, and I only discovered this quite recently. I, I kind of knew of Cha, just, uh, I knew that she'd written this really strange experimental book called Dicte, but I didn't know that she, sewed her own little books made of cloth um, and as Helen said I'm a zine maker and I kind of the first time I made anything um, I think the first time I kind of tried experimenting with poetry was in making zines and folding my own little books and there are digitized online which you can look at for free there are 21 little artist books um, in the online archive of California. And this is one of them it's called Pomegranate Offering. I think it's quite small. I haven't got the measurements there, but it's linen and stamped with ink. Um, I really love this one. And this is some of the pages from it. And the words here in this one really remind me of Dicte where there's veils, the word veil very frequently comes up and like here on this page, it, it kind of passes through, it kind of transforms into a French word and back into English and, and back again. And so the word is really flexible and malleable. Um, when I look at these little books, I, re I kind of, do have that feeling like they're like speaking to me, <laughs> which um, which you get sometimes when you look at particular artworks. And yeah, I don't know, I feel a bit obsessed with them. Um, this other one is interesting. I think this one is paper as well, not cloth. And she's used kind of Japanese bookbinding technique and the calligraphy as well. Um, I couldn't find pictures of the interior of this one but I really love it. And here is um, 
Yeah, it's been described as an artist book, but this one, Father, Mother, um, is an envelope containing these, I think, are like kind of plastic, um, tiny little photograph holders with pictures slid inside. I love that it's bound with that red thread. And this image is of her father. Um, and there's another one of her mother. And those two pictures, I think they're both of her parents before they immigrated to America. And they pop up in dictate as well. So there are these um, ancestral, well, not, not really ancestral, directly, um, her direct family pop up again in her work. Um, and in this one, there's something kind of reminiscent of like travel documents or immigration documents, passport, photo. Um, I feel like it's re-recording or retracing that journey of exile. And I think the same could be said of this photographic series called Chronology. Um, I won't read out that whole quote from an art critic, Rob Marx, but I like the way he says um, that they, yeah, spiral towards linguistic and visual disorder, piling on of family relationships and char memorializes displacement. Um, I love that she does this in quite a strange way, not a very obvious way. The words at the top and bottom are, at first glance, they don't necessarily speak directly to the photo. Um, and she manipulates um, photographic processing, layering photos on top of each other. Um, kind of, to me, it's like layering memory. Um, and yeah, I kind of see these pieces of memory stitched together and words, kind of bits of poetry scattered around the edges. Um, to me, it makes me think of kind of the difficulty of approaching um, generations old memories or stories where details have been lost or the holders of those memories have been lost and um, the difficulty of putting that into words or into visual form, but still finding a kind of memorial for it. Um, I love this blue as well, which I think is what led me to make this zine and print it in blue and red, um, which I'll talk about more in just a second. Um, yes, yeah, so that was kind of a, a brief overview of some of basically my favorite pieces of her art, <laughs> but, um, I'm interested in how this connects to her writing. I feel like all these pieces of her creative work were all very much part of a whole and weren't separate. So that's how dictate contains uh, photographs and letters and um, strange kind of script script fragments. I think Kathy Park Hong, Hong describes dictate as um, almost like a script for a, I think she says conceptual video art, which is a good description. Um, so, yeah, last year, was it last year? Yeah, <laughs> um, when Helen um, asked me if I wanted to take part in one of these seances and respond respond to a, a poet, I kind of felt drawn towards Cha. Um, I think because at the time in my own writing, I was thinking of how I can find ways of disrupting um, how I usually write, um, disrupting poetic forms and essay forms. And all of her work is, is disruptive in almost every way. 
Um, but it's also very difficult. And so I felt that the only way I could really respond would be in a zine. Um, and I think that zines like Dicte are really hard to categorize. And so I feel that that it's quite a good fit. And I like that the finished product did end up being printed in a kind of a bit patchy and a bit like smudgy, um, very DIY, which is how I do, how I make things. And um, the result is a kind of collection of weird bits and pieces, um, acrostic kind of responses to her artworks, like some of the pieces I showed you and also taking collaged bits from Dicte and bits from my own memories. So it's ended up as a, yeah, <laughs> I keep moving my hands around a collage, I guess. But I think I'll read some of the poems now. And um, the whole zine is, you can read it on Dead Woman Poet Society website. You can also buy a copy. And also I'm going to put the poems that I'm reading up here. I apologize that they are a bit, they're a bit, yeah, they're not the clearest, but I tried to make them quite big. Um, hopefully that will help. And this is the zine. Um, it is, it, as you said, it can be read in pretty much any order, which is confusing when I read from it, which I've never done before. Um, this is, oh, that, sorry, my cat is in the background. <laughs> um, outfit. Kathy Park Hong's essay, Portrait of the Artist, begins with the description of what Chow was wearing on the day she was last seen. A white Angora sweater, a red leather coat, a maroon beret, leather gloves, what color were they? A double layer of socks, a handbag, material color unknown, containing an envelope of her photographs for an upcoming exhibition, shoes, unspecified, presumably winter boots, as it was the beginning of November, the first real day of cold, No language. Your handwriting resembles mine. Small looped threads, I touch them. Entering dicte, I pass through veils to enter a landscape of dust and lunar snow. You speak in remnants, gestures, utterances. Ghosts are not enough. Memory breathes. You wrote to your mother from Seoul. Every bird that migrates north for spring and south for winter becomes a metaphor for the longing of return. Your mouth opens, the sky opens, fragments float down, snow gloves, snow geese, snowdrops from heavy clouds, language of spilled water, language of mist, before snow, after snow, snowshoes, language of white cloth, of commas, bordered language, demarcated language, snow blindness, snow cap, Swallowed language, folded language, snowy owl, snow pea, snow drift. I'm trying to listen to the silence. Snow mother, snowfall, snow fields. Your language of women is the language of snow. This one I have to fold out. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, here we are. <laughs> Performance notes. The performer puts on the glove, stretches out her fingers to feel the seams. She then takes it off and drops it in the middle of a small circle of objects, offerings, a shard of blue porcelain, a stamped boarding pass, a bowl of mandarins, all partially unpeeled. A looped voice recording. My mother lent me a pair of gloves to prepare me for the coldest month. Black suede with a fleece lining. She said, these, she said these were the only gloves that would keep me warm. At Panjia Yuan Market in the snow, I pulled off one glove to touch something, some small fragments of porcelain. And when my fingers began to ache in the cold air, I reached for the glove in my pocket but it was gone. Snow memory. It may have been snowing the day her brother found the place. Snow comprises ice crystals, remnants, suspended in the atmosphere, memory, a fallen glove in the flashlight beam, illuminated, full. Within clouds, commas, containing frozen crystalline water, utterances. Impossible to look, impossible to look away. The crystals fall, flow, accumulate, gather, precipitate dissolve, then melt, slide, or sublimate away. I heard the swans in the rain she dreamed. The swans became snow. Um, this one, as you can see, could change every time I try to read it. Um, there's a there's a there's a screen reader friendly version on the Dead Woman Poet Society website as well, which doesn't look like this. Um, but tonight I'll read it this way. Night after night, the sound of distant waves. A transcript of words between mothers and daughters. A dream dictation. You do not see her yet. Night after night, a dream of distant waves. It may have been snowing. You do not see her yet. You see traces of snow. Night after night, the sound of distant waves. You do not see her yet. You see traces. Night after night, a mother lifts her daughter up. It may have been snowing. Hmm. Oh, there it is. Um, this is the last piece that I'll read. Um, the zine can be read in any order, but I do maybe think of this one as the last piece. Um, so just before Cha was killed, she was working on a series of photographs of hands in uh, Renaissance paintings, I think. So I think she would go around the gallery and take photos of the paintings. Um, so this came from that. At the Metropolitan Museum, 1982. The heels of her boots squeak on the hard floors. Early October in New York, the first day she's thought to wear winter boots. 
dried leaves and paper bones hang from the trees. After work in the empty museum, she walks along the wide corridors, her camera hanging from a strap slung over her shoulder. She faces a wall of Renaissance paintings, white skin, curved bodies, velvet. She brushes her hair out of her face. It is the hands she's looking for, fingers, wrists, cuffs. She leans forward to study the curve of an angel's hands resting in her lap. A line of shadow can be seen under the thumb as if her two hands are not quite touching, one of them slightly lifted in the air above the other. She raises her camera. So that's my poems and my brief resurrection. Um, thank you so much for joining, for listening. Um, and like I said, if you have trouble reading any of the poems, they are available to read on the website. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nina. That was perfect. Um, I can't believe that was half an hour. I feel like that was 10 minutes and then you already were finishing. Um, so thank you. There's so much in there that, um, yeah, I want to mull over a, the language of women and the language of snow and the language, the vowels. Um, yeah. And also I think very important to talk about um, when we're talking about dead women poets to talk about not trying to or trying not to read the work too much as being haunted by however that life might have ended, which I think with the classic example of Plath, um, we often do with women. Um, and yeah, trying to balance the, the truth of what happened with um, seeing their work in the way that they wanted us to see it. And I think you did a great job of that. So thank you. Um, it might be a good moment to mention that um, we're actually fundraising for Sisters Uncut um, with um, a zine as well <laughs> um, called Resistance. Um, I have it here. Um, you can get it through our website. It's full of... Um, photos and poems um, edited by uh, co-director Lily Arnold and every single penny of profit goes to Sisters Uncut who um, fight against cuts to domestic violence services and lots of other good things as well. Um, I trust that, oh yeah, look, somebody's already put it in the chat. Thanks, Jazz, <laughs> you're always on it. Um, great, so. Thank you again, Nina. Um, we're gonna move on to our second poet resurrector of the evening, um, Bridget Minimore, who is a poet, editor, dramaturg, journalist, and essayist from Southeast London. Um, I know her as my tutor from the Roundhouse Poetry Collective. Um, and you will know her as the co-founder of the collective Critics of Colour, which aims to make writing about theatre, dance, and opera more accessible. Um, and also the author of Titanic, a quick paced pamphlet about love and loss, um, which is by turns extremely funny <laughs> and uh, devastatingly relatable. Um, she's going to be resurrecting Margaret Walker um, and you can already read her, also her poem in response to Walker on our website. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to having Margaret Walker's presence with us in the Zoom room, so. Take it away, Bridget. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, that was such a generous intro. Thank you, Helen. Um, and I feel like my mind is so busy mulling over Nina's talk that I barely want to do get into mine. But um, yeah, there is space for all Devon poets in the seance. Um, so I actually, I was a little bit torn about how to present this because I feel like people either really know about who Margaret Walker is or really don't. And um, one of the sort of thoughts I'd like to leave in everyone's head for the rest of the next 20 odd minutes is what, how, what expectation do we need to have um, of remembrance? 
um, especially when it comes to women of color, to black women, to black women writers, uh, for so, so much of the black and maybe specifically black American, but I would also actually say just black um, literary tradition, I think roots itself in this, I feel very rooted in this idea that we must honor our, fa our foremothers and forefathers and whatever, and we must represent them. And um, a lot of the black writers, especially American black writers are just very, very famous or kind of unknown. And so, yeah, I just wanted to leave that there as a, as a little thought just for the rest of this talk, just, just can we expect um, a certain level of remembrance for certain writers? Is that good? Is that bad? Um, is it entitled? Uh, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, those were the questions I was asking myself. So, Margaret Walker, um, I'll do just a quick summary. She was born in Birmingham, Alabama in 1915, and she had a long and pretty happy life, which is kind of great. Uh, she died at 83 years old of breast cancer um, and she was still writing, she was still publishing and she kind of got her flowers while she was alive, which is something that I'm very grateful for. She was the daughter of a Methodist preacher and despite coming from Alabama, she spent most of her life in Chicago where she got married and raised her children. She was a huge part of what uh, one might call the Chicago Renaissance, Chicago Literary Renaissance, um, which is how I discovered her work. Uh, I focused a lot on the Harlem Renaissance when I was at university, which is sort of the, the uh, slightly more well-known, quote unquote, uh, black literary renaissance in the 20th century in America. Um, and a lot of the time I would uh, read about, you know, the more famous members of that Harlem Renaissance, the Zorino Hurstons, the Langston Hugheses, the County Cullens, and uh, Margaret Walker's name in the Chicago literary renaissance would be bubbling around the surface. Um, and so I thought, let me Google her. And this is years and years and years ago. And I discovered lots of things. She was the first black woman in the United States to win a national writing prize, which um, is such a big fact. I always want to double check if it's true, but it is. Um, and so it seems kind of wild to me that she isn't as recognized as the Toni Morrison's or the Gwendolyn Brooks's of the world. Um, and that, that question, she, like does should she be recognized is one that I struggle with um because yeah how much how much can we expect this um but she won the uh, National Writing Prize for her poetry collection For My People in 1942 she was an academic she taught around the states but mostly in Chicago she uh, had three albums of poetry and she wrote a novel novel called Jubilee that I will quote a little bit from later that um is based on the life of her enslaved great grandmother um, and so, yeah, the first of her poems that I discovered was For My People, which is also the title of that first collection. But I actually thought I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and read as many poems as I can and talk as little because I tend to ramble. Um, and I also feel like she's a poet that if you do want, are interested in more about her life and her history, you can look online and there is like a wealth of stuff. There are some really, really interesting lectures. Howard University did one that is online and on YouTube and it's great. Um, I actually should have found the link and posted it. I will see if I can multitask and do that later. Um, but her poetry I think isn't just heard enough. So I thought it'd be nice to read lots of that. Um, and so a poem, one of her lesser known poems, but one that I did like, a lot when I first discovered her writing, I'll just share it quickly, is called I Want to Write and it's one of those poems that I would sort of um, get out in workshops for teenagers and young people, hopefully you can all see that now, uh, and it's very short and I'll, I'll just read it for you. I want to write, I want to write the songs of my people, I want to hear them singing melodies in the dark, I want to catch the last floating strains from their sob-torn throats. I want to frame their dreams into words, their souls into notes. I want to catch their sunshine laughter in a bowl, fling dark hands to a darker sky and fill them full of stars, then crush and mix such lights till they become a mirrored pool of brilliance in the dawn. Okay. Um, and yeah, so I thought I'd start with that poem rather than one of her more famous poems, because I think it's rare that we get such explicit um, intention from, from poets as clearly as, as Walker likes to write. Uh, that clarity is something that 
is scattered throughout her work. If you look up some of her academic um, writing and also if you hit, uh, learn from old, uh, read some of the accounts from old students of hers, one of the things that she would sort of reinforce was clarity and uh, a kind of sort of getting rid of the opaque language that is opaque for no reason other than being opaque and that's definitely something that I have carried with me both as a writer and, and as a facilitator or at least I've tried to do that um, and so this poem I think really encompasses all of those ideals this is why I'm here this is what I'm writing and these are the things that I would like to write um, and so, yeah, after she moved to, Ch to Chicago um, as a young woman, she uh, studied at Northwestern University and she began um, working with the Federal Rights Project. Um, and it was a sort of a precursor to the National Endowment for the Arts. And essentially she got money to write and to study. And one of the outcomes of that was For My People, that groundbreaking collection that um, won the National Writing Prize that has sort of lived on in so many ways. Uh, and I will read that too. Um, when I share this here. Um, and I will say, actually, uh, I was pleasantly surprised by how much of her work is readily available online, which is why I thought I'd link them all. So you can also see like the website and stuff. Um, Poetry Foundation, big up, well done. They've also got some really nice interviews with her that I will um, quote from later. So For My People by Margaret Walker. For my people everywhere singing their slave songs repeatedly their dirges and their ditties and their blues and jubilees, praying their prayers nightly to an unknown God, bending their knees humbly to an unseen power. For my people lending their strength to the years, to the gone years and the now years and the maybe years, washing, ironing, cooking, scrubbing, sewing, mending, hoeing, plowing, digging, planting, pruning, patching dragging along, never gaining, never reaping, never knowing, and never understanding. For my playmates in the clay and dust and sand of Alabama, backyards playing, baptizing and preaching, and doctor and jail and soldier and school, and mama and cooking and playhouse and concert and store and hair and Miss Tumby and company. For the cramped, bewildered years we went to school to learn to know the reasons why and the answers to and the people who and the places where and the days when in memory of the bitter hours when we discovered we were black and poor and small and different and nobody cared and nobody wondered and nobody understood. For the boys and girls who grew in spite of these things to be man and woman, to laugh and dance and sing and play and drink their wine and religion and success, to marry their playmates and their children and then die of consumption and anemia and lynching. For my people thronging 47th Street in Chicago and Lenox Avenue in New York and Rampart Street in New Orleans, Lost, disinherited, dispossessed and happy people filling the cabinets and taverns and other people's pockets and needing bread and shoes and milk and land and money and something, something all our own. For my people walking blindly spreading joy, losing time being lazy, sleeping when hungry, shouting when burdened, drinking when hopeless tied and shackled and tangled among ourselves by the unseen creatures who tower over us omnisciently and laugh. For my people blundering and groping and floundering in the dark of churches and schools and clubs and societies, associations and councils and committees and conventions, distressed and disturbed and deceived and devoured by money-hungry, glory-craving leeches, preyed on by facile force of state and fad and novelty, by false prophet and holy believer. For my people standing, staring, trying to fashion a better way from confusion, 
from hypocrisy and misunderstanding, trying to fashion a world that will hold all the people, all the faces, all the Adams and Eves and their countless generations. Let a new earth rise. Let another world be born. Let a bloody peace be written in the sky. Let a second generation full of, out, full of courage issue forth. Let a people loving freedom come to growth. Let a beauty full of healing and a strength of final clenching be the pulsing in our spirits and our blood. Let the marital songs be written. Let the dirges disappear. Let a race of men now rise and take control. Okay, um, that, yeah, it's a long one, but I wanted to read it in its entirety, which is why I'm trying to like not bog myself down in too many um, details about her. But I think if you do, yeah, I definitely recommend reading that poem a few times just to sort of get it into your head and to try and think of how, yeah, there is that startling quality all the way through. Um, and this idea of resurrection, uh, I think it's almost scary to think about how do we resurrect someone who, who was so clear and so precise about what they were saying, what they wanted to say, especially as, as women writers and, and thinking of that lineage of being part of women writing. It's always like, oh, okay, this is what a woman writer was saying. Maybe I need to, maybe I need to have that. And so, yeah, it is something that I struggle with. It is something that I, um, wonder about and don't really have any answers to but I love that poem and I remember so vividly reading it uh, I've always been a little bit obsessed with like Anjanman uh, with long poems with poetry that kind of tumbles over itself in in its attempt to uh, tell you something very simple in as many different ways as possible the lack of punctuation, the, uh, yeah, the, the fourth, the sort of slow, steady march on um, is just such, yeah, I think it works so well and reminded me so much of what was, before I read this poem, one of my favourite uh, poems as a teenager uh, by A Prayer Before the Birth by Louis McNeese, who is very different to Margaret Walker, but um, just that sort of long march of, of this is what I'm saying. I, yeah, I always find that parallel to be kind of interesting and kind of startling. Um, so, uh, For My People came out, it was a massive success. She was a massive success. Uh, the Chicago writers were gaining prominence. She was uh, friends with lots of great writers. She, you know, Richard Wright, uh, she, they had a big friendship before they sort of, sort of fell out. The, the reasons behind that remain sort of unclear but when he was writing Native Son she was there and she was a big aide to him um she was I actually might show you these photos uh it's a shame some of the few photos we have mm, is it a shame it's something interesting to note uh I should say um some of the few photos we have of Margaret Walker uh, are by Carl Van Vechten, if you know him. He was a white uh, writer who became very successful in the Harlem Renaissance um, for being sort of a white patron of, of, the, of the black arts. He, he wrote a poem, a poem, a novel, novella, it's like 230 pages, sort of about how great black Negro life was. Um, it's called Nigger Heaven, which is why no one ever talks about it now. Um, but uh, one, he is his archive is one of the most extensive Black American archives, uh, and so that dichotomy of definitely, you know, fetishizing blackness and and leeching off it in loads of ways. And that isn't to say that the entirety of the Harlem and the Chicago Black Renaissance writers were united with him. Uh, you know, Hughes was really with him. Walker, you know maybe not with him with him but tolerated him and he took a photo and stuff but like county i think county cullen he was very very against him um a lot of the black writers who weren't necessarily born in america who came from like jamaica and caribbean they were a little bit more wary of this white guy who um was just sort of always there but he took these really beautiful portraits of um margaret walker this is one and this is the other um and yeah that's his sort of classic style um 
if you ever see a photo, a portrait like this of a black American in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s with sort of a plain silky backdrop, it's almost certainly going to be a Carl von Vechten, Vechten photo. He's, he photographs everyone and is on the back of all of the books. And it's again, an interesting idea about memory and, and, and um, homage and, and yeah, that's always, always a complicated thing to think about. Um, and so, I no, I will I will read from uh, her novel and just talk about that for a brief moment. Um, so uh, in oh, what year was this? I have my notes disappeared. To in 1966, um, Walker wrote the novel Jubilee, which essentially um, detailed the life of her enslaved great grandmother. Um, the main character is called Viri. It's still kind of uncertain if that was her great-grandmother's name or not, but Jubilee uh, was like moderately successful. It's a historical novel. Uh, Viri is a biracial slave during the American Civil War and it's set in Georgia and then parts of Alabama. Um, what was really interesting, even though Viri is the main character, is there's also a character called Randall Ware, uh, a freed, uh, a, a black man born free, a freed black man, who is essentially just a radical and um, it's amazing. And some of the things that um, Walker, in lots of her interviews, it was, very, it was a very controversial character to have, shall we say. And I just wanted to um, quote her in uh, an interview with Margaret Walter from Walker from uh, Callaloo magazine, which was like a magazine of the 20s and 30s. Um, and someone asks, uh, I'll begin by making reference to your poem for my people. I noticed in a few of your poems uh, that the tone appears to be quite angry and hostile towards the system. Then we started reading Jubilee and the tone changed. I detected a kind of consola conciliatory tone at the end. The question is, when did, your when did you change your attitude? Um, this is a, a black interviewer uh, writing, I don't have the name, sadly. But Walker said, uh, because people considered Jubilee because she had all these different, it wasn't uh, as seemingly radical as for my people. Um, I don't believe I've ever changed. I regard myself as having been an Amer an, a critic of American society since I was a child. My poetry may sound far more militant than my prose, however, many people misunderstand what I'm saying in Jubilee. I'm sure that there are those, not necessarily my friends, who find as much militance and as much protest in Jubilee as in For My People. Moreover, I have been told that Jubilee makes a strong political statement, of which I was not quite quite as aware as I have been made aware. I try to show several points of view in Jubilee, my novel. I am dealing with a number of characters and I have only one who manifests a kind of militant spirit and that is Randall. That is precisely what I had intended. I could not take a woman like Veri, who reflects the Christian upbringing of the quarters and of the big house and show her as a revolutionary. To me, that is completely out of the question. Many people have raised the question of black nationalism and militancy in Randall, and even the woman in whose house I lived in at the time I was writing asked me, isn't he ahead of his time? Where did he get those ideas? As a matter of fact, he had those ideas then. There, there have always been such ideas among black people in this country. Randall simply represents a segment of the black population. Um, yeah, it's a... Uh, it's a great interview um, and I might just share in the chat if you want to read it. It's on, it's on JSTOR, um, the whole thing. Uh, oh, no, I will put that there. Um, but yeah, it's a really great interview and I think it is a reminder to so many of us as writers that we can, again, I keep on sticking to this idea of clarity, be as clear as we intend to be. And uh, also the sort of limitations and expansions of poetry and prose and how Walker says, you know, I had all these different characters so I could, I'm not necessarily being watered down. I just have, I'm showing different points of view and I'm showing uh, different ways um, around looking, uh, at looking at blackness and black militancy and black politics. And the characters in the book definitely uh, have very different, um, thoughts and feelings around the American Civil War, around whiteness and around their place in the system. 
Um, I wanted to read from Jubilee, but it's actually quite a long segment, so I'm not going to. But I will say that quite a lot of the book is on Google Books. Um, if you want to go to like the second or third page, I'm sure you can find it online for free if you'd like to read it. Um, but also, across it from a library, it's, yeah, a really, um, I think, a really underrated novel. Um, I should also point out the that um, Margaret Walker actually sued Alex Haley, who is the author of Roots, um, and she accused him of breaching a copyright. She said that he uh, plagiarised. Uh, and if you have read both books, which I have, there are definite similarities in terms of the following of the Black American family and the, the influx of uh, the influence of um, the war, slavery, lineage, generational trauma, etc., etc., etc. Who? Yeah, it's a hard one. I'm not sure. Uh, the case was actually dismissed, mostly because of the fact that he was Alex Haley and at the time was the most successful black writer America had. Um, and she was kind of like an old lady, I think, seen by the courts. You can actually read some of the court transcripts and stuff online if you have a little Google as well. Um, and it's not explicit, but obviously that sort of misogynoir and, and ageism is kind of there, uh, which is a shame because I actually think it could have been a really interesting case to assess um, how, how much does one own, because, you know, she wasn't telling her story, she was telling her grandmother's semi-fictionalized story, but it's also such an African-American story, right? And so it's like, how, how much can she own that story and how much can she say that story is her story when it's also the story of millions of black Americans? Uh, so yeah, I really recommend reading Jubilee, especially if you've read or watched Roots. I think uh, she definitely, the characters um, definitely influence a lot of later fiction. People like Nella Larson and the whole like quote unquote tragic mulatto trope in, uh, not trope, but just um, sort of fiction, fictional idea definitely comes from there. Uh, the idea of following, yeah, the African-American family over a long period of time. Uh, you know, a lot of people attribute that to Alex Haley, but I would attribute it to Margaret Walker. Um, yeah, she is great. And it's a really interesting novel, especially when you compare it to the likes of Their Eyes Are Watching God. Um, I love it a lot. And so I thought I actually do need to read my, my response, don't I? So let's do that. Um, so when I was asked to yeah, resurrect a dead woman poet, I definitely thought of Margaret Walker first. Um, and then once I decided it would be her, it was pretty easy to work out how and what I would do in response. Um, Right, oh, here's mine. Yeah, so yeah, I did a golden shovel. I've called the poem Golden Shovel for My People. Uh, and um, if you don't know, a golden shovel is a poetic form where you essentially get the lines or a line or something from another poet and uh, all the words at the end of at the end of each line, the words, if you read going down, that's like a line from someone else's poem or a stanza. Um, and yeah, it just, A Golden Shovel just felt really right for lots of reasons. So uh, The Golden Shovel form was invented by Terence Hayes, uh, who uh, did it in tribute to Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, her poem, We Were Cool. And Gwendolyn Brooks is also from Chicago, is definitely also part of that Chicago literary renaissance. Um, lots of people kind of call her the foremother of the Chicago literary renaissance, which I don't think is meant as any disrespect to Margaret Walker, but I think is part of that like erasure of her um, and it's, a sh yeah, and um, it just felt really nice to do a golden shovel to sort of bring that back round. Um, and also I was reading lots of stuff around golden shovel, like lots of, there was, there's been a few academic -y things about what it means to write in homage to people. And I found um, a really nice quote that I'm actually gonna read from Don Cher, he wrote it in Poetry Magazine. And he said, um, Uh, he said, as Robert Lee Brewer has pointed out, such a poem is part sento, part erasure. But don't let the word erasure mislead you. A poem in this form adds something even where it subtracts. The sum isn't necessarily greater than the parts, but in keeping with the spirit of paying tribute, it's more than equal to them. So yeah, I, I like that idea when, when it comes to writing after poetry, writing poetry after other poets. Um, so let me share that one more time. Um, actually, let me, yeah, 
the Dead Women Poets website, where it's conveniently there, where you can read it. Um, so yeah, if you read down, it's that stanza, for my people everywhere singing their slave songs repeatedly, their dirges and their ditties, and their blues and jubilees, praying their prayers nightly to an unknown God, bending their knees humbly to an unseen power. Um, which was really hard, actually. <laughs> I was like, which is quite long. She does quite long stanzas. Um, but when I, yeah, suddenly it just all clicked into place. So I was really grateful for this commission. Thank you very much. So go, uh, Golden Shovel for My People after Margaret Walker. This is where it started. I have been searching for a new way of living, breathing, thriving, but my body has begun to fill with broken people. The sounds they make feel infinite. Everywhere I look in each of my dark corners, I see singing. I see masses marching, searching, hunting for their new world, the home they knew each so-called slave should, would, could be entitled to. And their solemn songs are choking me. I have repeatedly asked, begged, demanded this noise stop, but their mouths are taped open, their hands are frozen. Some dirges need conducting, are too cold to let go of easily. And I have been sitting inside myself with their music bobbing like bad boats, their ditties on green repeat. Do I feel envy at the assurance and acceptance only the long dead feel? Music is licking my ears, their knowledge knows nothing but the blues, but that is all they need. Meanwhile, I know whites and we all know that's the problem. These songs last jubilees and it's obvious I can't keep praying for silence for an indefinite period of time. Their music is a reminder to stay angry. My prayers cannot hear themselves amongst the nightly cacophony of my ancestors. My body wants to be empty, but it is full of black shards. It is an example of yet another known unknown. I wonder if the long gone who haunt me think I am a god. I should kneel at my own altar, but I tried bending and lost my balance and now I can't stand up. Their racket might be exhausting, but when they sing, my knees refuse to knock. This is how it ends. I humbly request an audience with my own black body. I want to search for new ways to live amongst the noise. I am an item of measurement I cannot understand. My people are unseen. They are inside me. The music scares, holds, hurts. You give me power. Okay. Um, and I think I basically run out of time, but I will, I do feel so self indulgent ending on myself. I will just say, please look up um, if you want some more poems. I'd really recommend it's just so long. All her poems are so long. Um, look up October Journey, which I think is a real, I'll actually just post, there's like a link to a piece I found um, that has like 11 Margaret Walker poems. And those are some really great ones on there. October Journey is a really interesting reflection because she wrote it at the end of her life and she lived a really long life and not enough poets do, or people do, I should even say. Um, and so I think we should always be grateful when we have writers for a really long time and we can see their work progress over a really long time. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Excited to hear all of these these poems. Um, so we're going to start off with Sue Burge, um, who recently featured us in the journal Word City. So go and check out um, the Word Word City uh, interview with us. Uh, and Sue is a writer and a tutor based in North Norfolk. Her latest collection, Confetti Dancers, was published by Live Canon, um, and it deals with personal and generational loss uh, with a particular focus on the dance world of the 1980s which was decimated by the AIDS crisis and I really want to read that so um, welcome to the stage Sue. Thank you um, yep I'm unmuted that's great right I'm going to share my screen if that's okay um... Okay, so my um, chosen poet that I want to resurrect is um, Izumi Shibu, and she lived in the late 10th and early 11th centuries. She married twice, 
um, as she was the lover of both Prince Tamataka and Prince Atsumishi, Tamataka's brother. And the translator Kenneth Rexroth said, of all the poets of the classical period, she has to my mind the deepest and most poignant Buddhist sensibility. I think what interested me about her was that um, she's considered to have been the greatest woman poet of that period. 242 poems, including a wealth of passionate love poetry. And she was said to be a femme fatale with numerous lovers besides her two husbands and two princely lovers. Um, so her uh, most well-known work is a sort of pillow book that charted her romance with Prince Atsumichi. So I thought, because um, they're so tiny, I hope you don't mind, I'm just going to read two tiny, tiny tanka um, that just show how she um, vocalises loss and heartbreak. Why did you vanish into empty sky? Even the fragile snow when it falls, falls into this world. I thought to pick the fabric for myself, but I found it already growing in his heart. So they're, they're just heartbreaking. I think they're wonderful. Um, and then uh, for something completely different, I'm going to read uh, my own poem, When I Was a Witch. When I was a witch, I thought I could run underwater. When they pulled me out, they said I was smiling and my eyes had bleached from blue to jade. I wrote 10 ways to recognize a witch, then looked in the mirror. When they found my list, they pricked me full of holes, held me down until I became river sister, nibbler of water mint, holder of breath a water lily seeded in the sponge of my lungs and I bloomed with the genus other. Magic, it is said, can't work in water, yet here I am drying on the bank, still whole, still smiling. When I was a witch, I had a voice like hailstones. They put me in a sack, weighed it down with words, chose a good high bridge. I collaged the words into mini hexes on the backs of sweet wrappers. Oh purple, oh orange, oh shiny. When I was a witch I had a cat called Bert, wore my heart on my wrists. When I was a witch I built a cairn of hagstones on the strand line, luck bringers fairy binders, stone, stone with a hole like a moan for the moon to sail through. They say if you put one to your ear, you will hear Mer speak. Rings for my fingers, rings for my toes, breasts full of amber, but still I float. When I was a witch, I could play I spy with my little eye all day, with you and you and you. I was the shaking board that said yes, said no. When I was a witch, they poured the coldest water from the highest ledge and I burned and burned, but there was still witch left. So thank you for listening and thank you so much for this brilliant and enriching evening. Thank you so much, Sue. Oh my God, that was amazing. Um, can we read? Well, I, I believe you're muted now, so <laughs> you may not answer the question, but can we read that poem? Any, is it published anywhere? It was amazing. Not yet. Okay, well, go and publish it somewhere <laughs> because it's, yeah, I want to reread that. Like, When I Was a Witch is a, just a great title. Um, yeah, fantastic. And yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, great. Okay. Well, we're going to move on. You've set the bar really high. So <laughs> we're going to move on um, to our second open micer, Nina Relic, um, who is a poet and a fiction writer from London. Um, but she's currently a poetry MFA candidate at Columbia University in New York City. Um, so are you joining us from New York, Nina? Um, her work is published in the Tangerine and the Manchester Review and is forthcoming from Banshee Press. And here's Nina to tell us more. Thank you for that introduction. And Sue, that was amazing. Um, that was a really beautiful poem. I am not in New York. I am in um, the glamorous Sussex at the moment, um, which is a good second best. 
Um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen and read um, first a poem by Ruth Stone, which I really love. Um, she was an American poet and teacher. I think she published like 13 collections of books or something wild like that. Um, and I just love her work. I've chosen Winter, which is completely inappropriate for the heat wave. Um, so there you go. Um, winter. The 10 o'clock train to New York. Coaches like loaves of bread powdered with snow. Steam wheezes between the couplings. Stripped to plywood, the station cement standing room imitates a Russian novel. It is now that I remember you. Your profile becomes the carved handle of a letter knife. Your heavy lidded eyes slip under the seal of my widowhood. It is another raw winter. Stray cats are suffering. Starlings crowd the edges of chimneys. It is a drab misery that urges me to remember you. I think about the subjugation of women and horses, brutal exposure, weather that forces, that strips. In our time, we met in ornate stations, arching up with 19th century optimism. I remember you running beside the train, waving goodbye. I can produce a facsimile of you standing behind a column of polished oak to surprise me. Am I going toward you or away from you on the train? Discarded junk of other minds is strewn beside the tracks, mounds of rusting wire, grotesque pop art of dead motors, senile warehouses. The train passes a station, fresh people standing on the platform, their faces expecting something. I feel their entire histories ravish me. So that's Ruth Stone, a very cool lady. Um, and I'm gonna finish by reading a poem written by me, a less cool lady um, called February in Brooklyn. So here we go. The sparrows fuss over, chi over a chicken carcass, rib cage with the taut gray meat. The sparrows don't care how I feel about that. It doesn't disrupt their sense of order as it does mine. They aren't interested in the questions I've been asking myself of late. Like how much relief is too much? How many people should love me at any one time? Salt water, stock, seaweed extract. They call it plumping and it's supposed to make the meat juicy. It turns meat into more meat. These days I don't listen to music. I've been thinking about want. Across oceans, people have bodies and desire other people. In spite of everything, we want things so bad it makes us embarrassing. I don't believe in cool songs. I wish famous people would sing exactly what they mean. Like the Divinals, Chrissy with the red bangs, electric yellow guitar. Was there ever a more crystalline way of saying, I don't want anybody else. When I think about you, I touch myself. And that's me done. Thank you everyone for listening. Oh my God, that was so good. But <laughs> I didn't, I don't know Ruth Stone either. So that's, you know, a new poet and well, two new poets for me to follow up on. <laughs> Amazing. Ah, thank you so much, Nina. And, you know, Sussex has a beach. New York has a beach. It's basically the same. Um, <laughs> probably nicer weather today in Sussex so <laughs> um brilliant thank you so much um okay we're gonna move on to um Gemma Collins um who is a writer and an actor from Cork in Ireland um and she began writing poetry during the third lockdown um and now she's hooked uh so this is Gemma's very first open mic so she's lovely in the chat um take it away Gemma Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for having me. Like Helen said, this is my very first uh, poetry open mic. Um, so I'm gonna start with a poem by one of my favorites who actually, she's very recently deceased, only as of last year. Um, and I do truly wish I could bring her back. Um, so this is a poem by Avan Boland um, and it's called The Pomegranate. Um, I don't have anything to share on screen. It is just going to be my face, but hopefully that will be enough. The Pomegranate. The only legend I have ever loved is the story of a daughter lost in hell and found and rescued there. Love and blackmail are the gist of it. Series and Persephone, the names. 
And the best thing about the legend is I can enter it anywhere and have. As a child in exile in a city of fogs and strange consonants, I read it first. And at first I was an exiled child in the crackling dust of the underworld, the stars blighted. Later, I walked out in a summer twilight searching for my daughter at bedtime. When she came running, I was ready to make any bargain to keep her. I carried her back past white beans and wasps and honey-scented pedalias. But I was serious then, and I knew winter was in store for every leaf on every tree on that road. And for me, it is winter and the stars are hidden. I climb the stairs and stand where I can see my child asleep beside her teen magazines, her can of coke, her plate of uncut fruit, the pomegranate. How did I forget it? She could have come home and been safe and ended the story and all our heartbroken searching, but she reached out a hand and plucked a pomegranate. I could warn her. There is still a chance. The rain is cold. The road is flint coloured. The suburb has cars and cable television. The veiled stars are above ground. It is another world. But what else can a mother give her daughter with such beautiful rifts in time? If I defer the grief, I will diminish the gift. The legend will be hers as well as mine. She will enter it as I have. She will wake up. She will hold the papery flushed skin in her hand and to her lips. I will say nothing. Um, so for my next poem, one by me, um, I kind of wrote this as a semi-response to uh, that poem that I just read by A. Van Boland, um, which I kind of find it's a bit of like a, a homage to one of her favorite legends. So I kind of decided to write a poem about one of my favorite legends, um, which is a Welsh legend about two brothers and sisters um, whose names are Bran and Branwen. Uh, so this is a poem called Bran. Brother, you're a legend, always there to catch my starlings, respond to feathers squashed under my bedroom door, sneak me corned beef sandwiches and pints of Sunny D. I could never talk mam out of her totem silence, convince her it wasn't me who cut the tail from her horse. She listened to you though, older, only son, soon to become a character in one of her books on trench warfare. And when you left, I sent the starlings across the channel to Catterick, hiccuped my bird song over FaceTime and you said, Jem, I knew he was no good. Your face looks like kneaded dough. Your buzz cut and khakis were enough to send him packing. I knew you weren't a savage. You were the one who collected our bullet casings. You gave me this legend, brother, and I see it now. Chest caved in like a broken crown conch, full of slugs. I thought our father's brawn armoured you against the shelling, your flotsam spilling from the pages. I was wrong. I'll be on the first train down. And that is all for me. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, that's not really fair, Gemma. You can't have just started writing and come out with that. That's really upsetting. <laughs> um, thank you so much for sharing that. And Ewan Boatland is, yeah, a great choice. Um, very much missed. Um, wow. <laughs> this, is, this is a really good open mic. I'm a bit overwhelmed. Um, I'm going to move on to our next poet, who I know is also going to be fantastic, um, who is Ruth Yates, who is a poet living in Sheffield, um, who's been published in magazines and the anthology Introduction X, the poetry business book of new poets. Um, take it away, Ruth. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful evening so far. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So the poet I'm going to read from um, is called Sylvia Townsend Warner and she was born in, um, hang on a sec, sorry, born in 1893 and died in 1978 um, and she was also gay and a communist so the authorities weren't that keen on her and she volunteered 
in um, the Spanish Civil War with Red Cross. But I didn't know any of this when I read this poem. Um, so try and forget all that. It's called In April. I am come to the thresholds of a spring where there will be nothing to stand between me and the smite of the martin's scooping flight, between me and the halloo of the first cuckoo. As you hear the first cuckoo, so you will be all summer through. This year I shall hear it naked and alone, and lengthening days and strengthening sun will show me my solitary shadow, my cypress shadow. But no, my love, I was not alone. In my mind, I was talking with you when I heard the first cuckoo, and gentle as thistledown, his call was blown. Um, and now I'm going to read one that I've written um, called Damselfly, Old Moor. Old Moor is the name of a nature reserve. Damselfly, Old Moor. The joy came to us like an arrow shot by a celestial archer, landing in the flowers at our feet. A turquoise damselfly, like a tiny boned shard of semi-precious stone, a seahorse of the air. Maybe he reflected the sky, or his colour was a pigment that ran deep. O oh, damselfly, we worship your directness, your lack of curve, your point like a sharp pencil, held by a child, now landed just within reach. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much, Ruth. Ah, oh, great to hear you and to hear uh, both Sylvia Townsend Warner and yourself. Um, fab, wow. Um, okay, we're gonna keep, keep on going. Um, the next poet in the open mic is Suzanne Ayupa who is a poet and conservationist living and working in the Dovey Valley, mid Wales. She is a columnist for Spelt, a UK literary magazine celebrating rural life. Um, so, Suzanne. Hello everybody. This has been really, really good. I've really enjoyed the, the two um, presentations and the poets, um, Nina and Bridget. And then I've also enjoyed hearing all the voices, I really think it's a brilliant event. Um, so thank you very much for everything. I'm going to, I should have chosen someone more obscure, but I, I have been working on a, <clears throat> a poem that's inspired by Elizabeth Bishop. So I'm gonna share a poem by Elizabeth Bishop. If I can just get this up, I hope you all can see that. Um, I'm sure you guys know a lot more about Elizabeth Bishop than I do. Um, I admire her poetry. Most of what I know about her personal life is from watching a movie. I can't remember the title of the movie, but she was a Pulitzer Prize winner by the time she went to South America and had a, um, a very long <clears throat> term relationship with a woman there. The thing I love about Elizabeth Bishop is her her observation, yes, but um, she's such a quiet observer. She doesn't really, when you look for the turn in her poems or what, I, what I think of as the turn, she makes it with sounds. She makes it with the sounds that she uses and her repetition. Insomnia. The moon in the bureau mirror looks out a million miles and perhaps with pride, at herself, but she never, never smiles. Far and away beyond sleep, or perhaps she's a daytime sleeper. By the universe deserted, she'd tell it to go to hell, and she'd find a body of water or a mirror on which to dwell. So wrap up care in a cobweb and drop it down the well into that world inverted where left is always right, where the shadows are really the body, where we stay awake all night, where the heavens are shallow as the sea is now deep, and you love me. Okay. 
I am going to go to my poem, which also mentions sleep. Um, this poem started as a, a meditation on the word saunter and its origin, which is from a phrase, a la santer, um, which comes from pilgrimage. And they used to ask the pilgrims, where are you walking? And they would say, a la santer. There's a map for where she walked, but where did she sleep? She slept in a field of mixed grazing, in a bund of fireweed for privacy, on the altar of a medieval church, the red carpet softening the steps against her hips, her tent drying strung out along the pews. She slept under a single central upright, all night conifer tresses radiating out from her face. She dreamed in pace. She slumbered, holding the manes of wild horses where they graze in numbers on sacred hilltops. She closed her eyes to a blank wall from a bare mattress in an empty holiday land. She crashed against water running downhill, roiling streamers through terraces and startled at every sudden movement. She dozed on the gravestone after using the cool surface to roll dumplings for rabbit stew. She slept in the lee of children's songs and woke to inky lines of otter springs. She lay under a pub table, snored against shoulders, and left grip marks either side in stone floor slabs. She slept at the confluence of three rivers, one from the mountain, one passing through farms, and one making up the border. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Oh, that was brilliant. Um, I love Elizabeth Bishop. Um, I have resurrected her myself um, for when we, back, back in the olden days when we couldn't pay other people to do it <laughs> and we did it ourselves. Um, yeah, she's one of my favorites. So I'm really glad that you've brought her into this space. Um, okay, so our next poet is going to be Gita Rally, who is a writer and an NHS doctor born to Indian immigrant parents in London, um, her debut poetry collection, A Terrible Thing, was published by Bad Betty Press in 2020. Um, and she is going to read her own translation of Amrita Pritam from Punjabi into English. And I'm very excited for her to be, to be doing her own translation. So give it up for Gita. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. What a beautiful, if slightly sweaty seance we're all having tonight. Um, so I just wanted to do it. So I'm just going to read my, my own translation, which is unpublished. So this is a bit of first, first open mic, first reading of a translation and first unpublished poem that, I, that I'm ever reading. But I really wanted to um, talk a little bit about her. Um, so these are, I hope you can see my screen there. So that's a picture of her later in life. So unlike so many of our dead women poets, she actually did have a long and happy life. So she um, was born in pre-partition India. Uh, was married very young at the age of 16, but already at the age of 16, she'd had poetry published. So she was really a bit of a prodigy. Um, and then after partition, she moved from what is now Pakistan, where her birthplace was, to India. She divorced in her 50s and had a long and happy relationship with a man who was much younger than herself. So she really kind of lived her life and did the things she wanted to do. It's very well known on both sides of the border um, in India and Pakistan, because of course, there's anyone else from a country that's been partitioned knows, you know, language doesn't respect the borders. So she, um, she was very popular on both sides of the border and uh, wrote beautiful novels as well as uh, poems. I'm just going to read a really a very short poem of hers. Um, the original title in Punjabi is um, Mera Pata, which just means my address. Um, but my kind of revisioning, <coughs> reworking trans, trans, of it is 
called Where You'll Find Me Now. This morning, when I left you, I scraped the painted number from our door. I wiped the brow of my fate clean of our last name. Spun the compass round as I passed, north, south, east, west. If you want to reach me, walk the long city streets, knock upon each door to find me gone, no trace. If a door opens, seek out a woman's face. Be watchful for a glimpse of her spirit. Once free, it rises to slip from her bound hands into life, a word or a line, her kind midwife. Consider this my gift to you, my curse. How else do I make you see for better or worse? Here is where you'll find me now. Thank you. Okay. Brilliant, thank you so much. That's, yeah, lovely, lovely to have a, um, a self-translation. Um, for those of you who don't know, I don't actually have it to hand. I usually have my copy of our issue of Modern Poetry and Translation. We, um, edited a whole issue last year um, of women, well, of translations of Deborah Moore poets. Um, so, yeah, we love a bit of translation. It's a good form of resurrection. Um, yeah. Okay. So we are now on to our final poet of the night, um, Marina Lasaraki, who is a visual artist who also writes poetry and fiction and who lives in Wellington in New Zealand um by the sea love i just think it's really poetic that we've managed to bookend this whole um seance with two new zealand poets um she is also halfway writing halfway through writing a ya novel so clearly also a cross genre writer um like nina and yeah take it away marina okay i'll just share screen mm. yeah. It's my tabs, so I want to go documents. Okay, here it is. Oh, hang on. I want Nina. Sorry, not Nina. Um, right, here we go. So this poem is written by um, Georgia Douglas Johnson. And she was born in 1880 and died in 1966. She was a member of the Harlem Renaissance. So she was an African American poet um, with Native American and English roots. And she wrote poems that addressed um, issues of race, but also about love, motherhood, and being a woman in a male dominated world. She published four collections of her poetry, but she was also one of the earliest African American female playwrights. And she wrote um, over 30 plays and yeah so there's a photo of her <coughs> now the poem that i chose is um called the heart of a woman and it's it comes from a book that um was originally printed and then this company called forgotten books reprint these old books and so you can see that the font is old-fashioned but I managed to track it down on Poetry Foundation website for you. The heart of a woman. The heart of a woman goes forth with the dawn as a lone bird soft winging so restlessly on. Afar o'er life's turrets and veils does it roam. In the wake of those echoes the heart calls home. The heart of a woman falls back with the night and enters some alien cage in its plight and tries to forget it has dreamed of the stars while it breaks, breaks, breaks on the sheltering bars. I wonder if Maya Angelou was influenced by this um, poem <clears throat> talking about the bird for me, this poem um, 
almost seems like it's about, um, it's a nice poetica. Like she's talking about the writing of poetry, um, making her soar and, and explore. But then at night she comes back and she's trapped, you know. So that's her poem. Now for my one, it's much, much more upbeat. Um, now this poem is, is a uni vocalic poem. So it's written with words with only one vowel. And the vowel that I chose was A. Rampant Harvard scandal. Law says that's wanky. Swanky mama Bob pays cows rally. All hanky panky cash scam. Harsh Arkansas farm bars saw that swanky mama Bob's rank sank. Bans that classy sass. Swanky mama Bob's rat pal Papa Al plays blackjack. Bandana clad last day at Manhattan Alps. Acts adamant and angry at hacks. Balls scram you all, that damn manky man. That swanky mama Bob and rat pal, pal Papa Al, that damn manky man, spark mass drama as law catch many shady hands. That rampant Harvard scandal, Sam, Sam, Sam. So, no one's ever got what this poem is about. So I'll just quickly say that um, the poem is about the um, actresses who were bribing the universities to get their children into college. And um, for example, the rally is tuition, um, the farm is prison, and um, hacks are journalists, and um, you know, Manhattan Alps are like, um, skyscrapers and Sam, 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 that's relating to Uncle Sam. Um, so yeah, that's my poem. Brilliant, thank you so much. Yeah, just stop it. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, as uh, Sue has said in the chat, um we've come full circle back to nina's uh talk about um char i was thinking that i didn't know that kathy park Kong had done univocal poems i was thinking that it was kind of recalling the formal disruption that char was uh interested in as well as well as being um a contemporary of margaret walker so you really tied everything together there for us marina thank you um so that's it that brings our our evening to a close. Um, you are now free to go and shower off. Um, we are going to send you uh, that feedback form via email. Um, Jazz, I reckon we'll probably drop it in the chat imminently as well. Um, and yeah, what else is there to say? We are at Dead Woman Tweet on Twitter and at Dead Woman Poet Sock on Instagram. Um, we are running another online event on the 31st of August with Jen Walsh and Charlotte Wetton, um, which is going to be great. Um, I will put a link in the chat now to that because I have it to hand. Um, so please do sign up for that if you're interested. Uh, and yeah, I think all that remains to say is thank you again to our wonderful poet mediums today, Nina Minya Powells and Bridget Munamore. It's been such a privilege to have you. Um, thanks to all our fabulous open micers. Thank you to Lily Arnold and Jasmine Sims who are doing all the tech behind the scenes and Lily for all our brilliant illustrations. Um, and thank all of you so much for coming, um, for listening on this warm evening um, and for taking part in tonight's Dead Woman Poets Society seance. Have a lovely rest of your evening.